All right, so what you have to be able to do, identify a biome from either a picture or a description and match the climat climatogram or climate graph to a specific biome and justify your choice. Okay, so here are the biomes of the world. So a biome is an ecological region that has certain characteristics, okay? And this is how they are distributed on Earth, right? So we'll look at first the tropical rainforest, which is the light green color right here, okay? So the tropical rainforest, as you can see, is, a, is an equatorial climate. We don't see any green beyond 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Okay, so it is definitely an equatorial climate. It cannot have distinct seasons, summer, winter, right? Like it, it has to be pretty much nice all year long okay, to make a tropical rainforest. And it has to be quite wet. Okay, there has to be a lot of precipitation in order to support the thick, luxuriant vegetation that tends to grow in the tropical rainforest. Okay, so where we see those, okay, uh, obviously lots of South America, like Colombia, Venezuela, you know, places like that. Okay, uh, some in Central America, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, okay, those kind of places on the in the Caribbean. Okay, there's some in Africa. Okay, but mostly in kind of the, the more central and southern parts of Africa, because obviously the northern part of Africa is not. Okay, it's, if you've ever seen Star Wars, it's where they film Tatooine. Okay, is up in here. Um, and then obviously in all of Southeast Asia and Micronesia and places like that, okay, all over here, that's all tropical rainforest as well. So definitely equatorial climate. Next one, the light brown is the savanna. Okay, the savanna would be what you would um, picture like the Serengeti being. Okay, like you've gone to Africa where there would be like you know elephants and giraffes and stuff like that. Okay, that's the savanna, and obviously it is mostly found in Africa. But there are sections of it, not necessarily with the same wildlife, okay, in northern Australia, okay, and there's some kind of man-made savanna here in South America, mostly as the result of deforestation. All right, then we got desert. So the golden color here, okay, so the desert, desert is not strictly shifting sands and, and stuff like that. There's different kinds of desert. There's hot equatorial desert, like um, North Africa, Tunisia, Egypt, places like that, okay? But there's also mid-latitude desert, okay? And that would be places like Utah, Arizona, and Nevada, where they do have seasons. It's just really dry, okay? So there's different kinds of desert, but what do all deserts have in common? They're all dry, okay? That's the key factor for a desert, but you can have hot deserts and you can have mid-latitude deserts. And then there's a biome all of its own, extreme desert, okay? And that would be like the white stuff that you see up here. So Greenland, the tops of all the top, tallest mountains, so the tops of the Rockies, the tops of the Himalayas, um, that continent that's missing, not Atlantis, Antarctica, that one at the bottom, okay? That would all be extreme desert, okay? And that was the next one right there. I knew it was on there somewhere. Okay, uh, Chaparral. Chaparral is not the place in South Calgary. Okay, different. Um, it is basically what we call the Mediterranean climate. I can't imagine why. Okay, being as there's basically only here around the Mediterranean. So Italy, Greece, all those places. Okay, um, those are Medi those are the what we call Mediterranean climate. There's little parts of of it that would look like it, be similar on the southern tip of Australia, the southern tip of Africa, okay, and a little bit here in kind of uh, Mexicali, okay, which would be southern California, northern Mexico, okay, it would be a little bit like that. Okay, um, temperate grassland, we call that home. That's where we live. Okay, we also call it prairie. Okay, in, in uh, Asia they call it steppe, but it doesn't really matter where you go, it looks pretty much the same. Okay, so we are very familiar with that one. It is all of obviously the prairie provinces, okay, down into the United States, places like you know, Montana, Wyoming, okay, uh, places like that. And then much of Central Asia would also be considered okay, to be um, grassland. Now you can see that interspersed in the grassland here is that darker gold color okay, of the desert. So this desert right here okay, is behind the Himalayas. So would this be a rain shadow? 
Okay, that's what we were talking about the other day. Same with these prairies. They are the rain shadow okay, of the Rocky Mountains. All right, so that's that whole mountain barriers play a role in climate thing. All right, um, then temperate deciduous forest. What does deciduous mean? If a tree is deciduous, what does it do every year? Loses its leaves. Okay, so deciduous trees lose their leaves. So that would be like poplar, birch, maple, oak, hickory, okay, all those kinds of trees that lose their leaves every year. So obviously, almost the entire eastern United States would be considered to be that. Okay, southern Ontario, okay, uh, even into northern Ontario a little bit, okay, would all be temperate deciduous forest, okay, uh, where the, we've got obviously trees that lose their leaves. Most of Europe okay, would also be temperate deciduous forest. Okay, and then we've got Tega after that. So Tega is the light blue. And if you've gone to Banff, you've been in the Tega. If you've gone to Fort McMurray, you've been in the Tega. Okay? Uh, it's basically just a carpet of spruce trees. Okay? And that's basically all you see. So much of okay, Canada is, is that. Okay? Much of Russia is that. Okay? Um, and there's, so it, there's a lot of it. But it's also a very rugged country. Okay? It's uh, very extremes in temperatures, very rugged landscapes, okay? difficult to access, things like that. And then the last one is the tundra. Okay? The tundra is an arctic grassland. So it's so cold that the trees can't grow. Okay? If, you've, if you ever you know, look out at the mountains, you can see where the trees end. And then there's, you know, not quite, it's not quite rock yet, but there's like a layer. And then there's a rock layer above that. That layer in between the trees and the rock is tundra. Okay? It's so cold that trees don't grow, but there's enough stuff there for small plants like grasses and mosses and stuff like that. Okay, so much of the very northern part of Canada is tundra. Okay, so this is where you'd find, you know, um, like caribou and, and things like that, polar bears. Okay, uh, and much of Siberia as well. Okay, would also be tundra. Okay. Making sense? Okay, so that's kind of where everything is. I'm never going to give you a map and ask you to label it. Okay, I'm never going to ask you just so you have an idea of kind of where everything is as we talk about them. Okay, so the tropical rainforest. How many of you have ever been to a place where there's tropical rainforest? Okay, like been to, you know, uh, parts of Hawaii would be tropical rainforest. Okay, if you've been anywhere, Costa Rica, okay, any place like that, places in Mexico would have tropical rainforest as well, depending on where you are. Okay, um, but it's very, very different from anything that we're used to here. Okay, um, it's incredibly wet. Okay, it rains all the time. Okay, and there's like a rainy season and a dry season. And the dry season still really rainy. Okay? Uh, so they get lots and lots of rain, lots of flooding. Okay? Most tropical rainforests are flooded much of the time. If you go to the Amazon okay, rainforest, which is obviously the biggest one there in South America, okay, you'll find that, that is basically half of it is underwater almost continuously. Okay? So rainfall far exceeds the ability of water to evaporate. What that leads to is very, very thick, tall, luxuriant vegetation. And a tropical rainforest, when you're standing in it, is very different from going to Banff and standing in the forest. Okay? If you go to Banff and stand in the forest, you can see between the trees. Okay? And there's like two kinds of trees. In the tropical rainforest, you will be hopelessly turned around in no time if you're walking. Okay? Because the forest just closes in around you. It's suffocatingly thick. Okay? And there's layers and layers and layers of it. There's like the, the ground level layer, and then there's understory, 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 canopy, canopy, canopy. Okay? There's all these different layers of vegetation and growth in the tropical rainforest. It's, it blots out the sun okay? if you're down kind of on ground level. Uh, and like I said, if you don't have a machete, you'll get lost. Okay, because you don't have a path of destruction to follow back. Okay, it's your trail of breadcrumbs. It's your path of destruction. Okay, and I only say that from experience. Okay, I went hiking in Hawaii in the rainforest one time, and had it not been that we were just really lucky and could hear a road at one point, we probably would have just died. Okay, because we just we couldn't tell which way was north, south. Okay, like it just you don't have any reference because you can't see the sun. Okay, it's really thick and everything looks the same. So, 
Um, that's what it looks like kind of from above, okay? Can't see down to the ground, really tall trees. All right, so the general characteristics. This would be the stuff that I would put in the description if it was a multiple choice question, okay? Um, they're complex, they're variable, they grow in areas with no distinct seasons. So that means their climate graph would have a temperature line that is flat, okay? Um, so there's no winter or summer, high temperatures, high rainfall, and high humidity, okay? So wet, okay? They dominate the climate of the rainforest. Precipitation exceeds evaporation and transpiration, so luxuriant vegetation develops, okay? Mountains in the tropical rainforest look way different than mountains here, okay? Mountains here have bare spots, okay? You get above the tree line and nothing grows, there's no tree line in the tropical rainforest. Okay? Mountains are like a chia pet. Stuff just grows all over it. Okay? It doesn't matter how steep it is, stuff can grow on it because it's always wet. Okay? The main reason stuff doesn't grow on steep slopes here is it's too cold and there's, nothing, there's not enough rain to keep it wet. Okay? So like all these really steep faces, they're all covered in trees. Okay? Even this like spire of rock has got growth on all over. It's, it's quite uh, crazy to see, actually. And you can see that the trees are just super thick. And there's lots of different kinds of trees. Look at all the different colors okay, in these pictures. Okay? Way different than what you see when you go to Banff and go up the gondola, and everything is the same green tree. Okay? All like Engelman spruce or all Douglas fir. It's all exactly the same. Okay, So the soils in the tropical rainforest are actually very poor. And the reason for that is they get washed away all the time. It rains constantly. So erosion is a big problem. And not, as, not only is erosion a big problem, but when you have water sitting on top of the soil, a process called leaching happens. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Okay? If you get a leach on you, what does it do? It sucks your blood. Yeah, okay. Well, the process of leaching happens when you have water sitting on top of soil and then all the stuff that's dissolved in the soil goes from high concentration to low concentration into the water sitting on top and the water literally sucks the nutrients right out of the soil, okay? Or leaches them out of the soil. So uh, they tend to be very weathered, okay? And don't have a lot of nutrients or minerals. They, the trees that grow there, the forests that grow there, get their nutrients right from the flood water, okay, as opposed to out of the soil. Their roots are really just for anchoring. Okay, they, they acquire their nutrients differently. Okay, decomposition is very rapid. Okay, here in Canada, if a tree falls in the forest, it makes a sound, whether you're there or not. That whole philosophical argument is dumb. Okay, if a tree falls in the forest, it makes a sound. Okay, simple physics, it does. Okay? And it sits there for like 20 years because decomposition here in Canada is very slow. We don't have a lot of insects. We don't have, we only have a few months of the year where decomposition can occur because it's not frozen. Okay? Whereas in the tropical rainforest, there's bugs, 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 fungus, 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 all the stuff that, that, deco that decomposes things and it's wet and warm all year long. So decomposition happens very, very fast. Okay? Um, Soils are often, like you said, low in nutrients, calcium, potassium, and they tend to have a reddish color because they're mostly clay, okay, and pulling of those nutrients out tends to stain them that way. All right, so the soils look kind of like this. Remember we were talking about the A horizon, the B horizon, and the C horizon? So there's virtually no topsoil in the tropical rainforest because it's always getting washed away. There's a very thick layer of clay, B horizon, and then the parent material will be under Okay, so vegetation. At ground level, this is what the tropical rainforest can look like. It's not like going for a hike in Banff. Okay, it's, it's hard to make your way through it because the vegetation is so thick. Okay, uh, so tropical rainforests are extremely diverse. Okay, they have lots of different types of trees. There are often up to eight different layers of vegetation from the ground to the tops of the tallest canopy. Okay? And there could be up to a hundred different tree types in one hectare. 
Okay? In a forest in Canada, you'd be lucky if you have 100 trees, period, in a hectare. Okay? But this is a place where there could be 100 different kinds of trees in one hectare. To give you an idea, in case you're going hectare, I have no idea how, I, how big that is. It's about the area enclosed by the football field. Okay? 100 meters by 100 meters. Okay? So in that area, there could be 100 different kinds of trees, not just 100 trees. There could probably be 1,000 trees. Okay, a hundred different kinds. All right, and most of the trees are evergreen because you don't want to go dormant in the rainforest. Okay, if you go dormant for any length of time in the rainforest, you'll get decomposed or grown over. Okay, you have to keep growing and, and stay uh, moving, well not moving, but staying producing all the time. Right? They also have these uh, weird root systems. I think I showed you this picture before, okay, uh, back in the bio unit. Okay? Their roots are mostly just an anchor, and they have these snorkel roots that allow them to still get oxygen and nutrients uh, um, below the water line. Okay, the animals in the rainforest. Contrary to what you may have heard, the lion is not the king of the jungle. Lions don't live in the jungle. Okay? They live in the savannah, but that's not the jungle. Okay? Tropical rainforest is the jungle, and there's no lions here. In fact, there are very few large animals in the rainforest because there's really nowhere for them to live. It's flooded a lot of the time. Okay? So the largest kind of animal you might see would be like the three-toed sloth, which is arboreal. It lives in the trees. Okay. It's so well adapted to that, that on each one of its toes is a big claw that looks just like a coat hanger. Okay. And they can just whip them over top of a branch and just hang out literally. Okay. And they don't have to exert any effort at all. Okay. But they're also very, very slow. Okay. They're like the most chill animal ever. Okay. They're never in a hurry to do anything. Okay. But they're also, if you put them on the ground, they can barely move. Okay? They've evolved to move in this position, okay? hanging like that. You put them on the ground and their muscles aren't designed to push them upwards. Okay? They're designed to hang. Okay? So they're very, very slow on the ground. You'll also have mostly rodents okay? as kind of your animals or mammals. Okay? Small stuff. Lots of amphibians. Okay? Lots of different kinds of frogs. Okay? Don't lick the frogs. Okay? Some of them will give you a bad trip, and some of them will just make you really sick, and some will be both. Okay? So don't lick the frogs, because somewhere somebody decided that was fun. Don't. Okay? That's gross. Um, and then bugs. If you do not like bugs, don't go here. Okay? You won't have fun. Okay? Um, like Lots of times, like hotels and things like that in the tropical rainforest will actually have bug nets over the beds. Yeah, because there's so many bugs. And they're not just little. Some of them are really big. Okay, like the dung beetle. Okay, those are the ones that literally make a big ball with their own poop to impress mates. That's not going to work for you guys. Okay. Sorry, so I'm just running back. But like in a quarter mile of any rainforest, there's as many insects as there are humans on the planet. I would totally agree with that statement. I would find that to be true. Yeah, lots and lots of bugs, and all kinds of different bugs. Okay? You can have things like a praying mantis, okay? or a walking stick. Has anyone ever seen a walking stick? Okay? They're really cool. They look just like a stick. Okay? And if you let them crawl on you, okay? they'll, get, they'll just hang from your fingers. And if you blow on them, they sway just like a leaf. Like they're perfectly camouflaged. Okay? But lots and lots of bugs, lots of biting bugs, spiders. How many of you right now are like, no, I'm not going to sleep tonight. It's a good thing a lot. Okay. Yeah, if you don't like bugs, don't go here, you won't have fun. Okay, um, so lots of species in the rainforest are arboreal, live in the trees, lots of them are endemic, okay, but there are no subterranean animals. Why? Yeah, they would drown. Yeah, you don't want to be a gopher. You can't be a gopher in the rainforest because you're a whole be full of water all the time. And so there, there just aren't any of those. All right, and like we said, chemical cycling is really fast. Things decompose really quickly because the conditions are perfect for the growth of bacteria and fungus, and there's lots of bugs to help with decomposition okay, and things like that. All right, questions on the tropical rainforest? All right, the savanna, our other kind of equatorial uh, biome. Okay, so obviously these are going to be uh, near the equator. They're going to be very hot, but the difference between the savanna and the rainforest 
is not the amount of rain, it's when the rain comes. Okay? The savanna can get just as much or even more rain than the tropical rainforest, but it has a monsoon season where it pours rain for three months, and then the dry season where it doesn't rain a drop for like six to eight. Okay? So you don't get a thick, luxuriant rainforest building up if you've got a huge drought period during the year. Okay? Um, so you get a very different type of thing. You get basically what is a tropical grassland okay? um, instead. Now, it's not like the grasslands here, not like where we live. Okay? The grasses are very, very different. So um, lots of parts of most of Africa, some parts of South America, generally it's referred to as a grassland biome, but it can often be open woodland. Okay? So there'll be sections of forest if there's like an oasis you know, and things like that. Okay? You'll get sections of, of trees as well. Okay, um, so the climate of the savanna looks like this. It's obviously equatorial because the temperature line is straight. Okay, there's no distinct summer and winter here. But as you can see, the rainfall isn't evenly distributed. Okay? If you're going to get big complex forests of any kind, tropical or temperate, you need even rainfall. This is definitely not that. Okay, so we can see here, this is rainfall, monthly rainfall in millimeters. 350 millimeters. Okay, that's 35 centimeters of rain in a month. Okay, so they've got this monsoon season where it literally pours rain nonstop for months. And then it just falls off. Okay, and then it doesn't rain hardly at all. Okay, for the rest of the year. All right, so um, they have very distinct hot and, or sorry, dry and rainy seasons, but they have basically hot weather the whole time. And okay. because of the big long dry season, there's going to be a lot of wildfires. Not something we have as a real problem in the tropical rainforest because it's always wet. Okay, but here there are going to be big wildfires, and that's kind of what keeps the forest down. Okay, because you're going to get these big grass fires and things like that that are going to happen. Okay, lots of plants here will go dormant during the dry season. Okay? And plants tend to be fire resistant. Okay? Like the uh, eucalyptus tree, for example. Okay? The eucalyptus tree can actually be, have all of its foliage burnt off, but its bark is porous. So the outer bark can burn, but because the bark is porous, it actually insulates the inside of the tree against the heat of the fire, and the tree can grow back. Okay? So some of them are adapted to kind of these conditions. All right. What is this cheetah sitting on? A termite mound. Okay. Once again, tropical bugs. Okay. There's lots of bugs in the savanna. Okay. Termites being one of the biggest ones. And termites make hills just like ants, except termites are bigger. And they eat all plant material. Okay. We don't ever worry about termites because our climate is too cold. But if you live in a tropical rainforest or a tropical area where there are termites, the building code is a lot different. Okay. You have to protect the parts of the home of homes that you build against termites. Okay. That's why you often see um, like homes and stuff made out of stone and brick as opposed to wood. Okay. If you build a house out of wood and you get termites, they'll literally turn it to sawdust okay. in a matter of and, you know, short, short time. Okay, um, so vegetation, okay, uh, many of the trees in the savanna, like we said, are fire resistant, okay, there's lots of termites, so plants in the rainforest produce an unfathomable number of seeds, just so that a few will survive, okay, and not be eaten, okay? that's how much uh, the, the termites uh, can eat, okay, um, there's lots of physiological resistance to water loss, plants, both grasses and trees grow in, in distinctive shapes to help shade their roots okay, and prevent water loss during the dry season. And you can get really long grasses in the savanna. Okay? Years ago, I had a student who came here from South Africa. And I was teaching this lesson and taught, telling the, the kids about this African elephant grass. And he's like, oh yeah, you wouldn't believe this stuff. He said, when we go to our summer house, 
every year. Like we, you know, we only go there in the summer. When we first get there, we have to take out the scythe, that thing the Grim Reaper has, okay? And we have to cut down the elephant grass because you can't see the house. And I'm like, do you have a picture of that? He said, yes. Do you see his house? Yeah. Elephant grass can be three meters tall, okay? It's really, like, it's called elephant grass because elephants can walk through it and not be seen, okay? It's kind of like bamboo. It's quite a bit thicker so that it can stand up so tall. Um, we have something kind of like it here. Uh, the town plants it. Lots of people plant it in their yards. It's called, um, it's the tall grass. It can grow up to be about six feet tall. And you'll see it in lots of the town's flower beds and stuff like that. I can't remember what it's called now. I have some in my yard. I don't know what it's called. Anyway. Uh, it can grow, you know, about six feet tall. This stuff, way, way taller than that. Okay? Uh, it's just crazy how tall it can get. Uh, but you can imagine that when it gets dry, that also means a big fire hazard. And you get a spark in that, and a wildfire can really get going because there's a lot of fuel. Okay, so savanna trees are often stunted, and if you see here in this picture and in this picture, okay, all of the trees are kind of umbrella-shaped. There, kind of like this. Okay, so all the trees are umbrella shaped, and that's so that they can shade their roots in the summer and be tall enough that most animals can't eat them. That's why giraffes evolved such a long neck, okay, and why elephants are so tall. Okay, but most of the smaller herbivores like zebras and antelope and wildebeests and stuff like that, okay, they can't reach that stuff. It's too Okay, but it does shade their roots, okay? Acts just like a sunshade, all right? So, um, soils, soils are really thick in the savanna because there's all this grass and every year the grass goes dormant and builds up this layer of mulch, okay? That can decompose and become more dirt, okay? So you got really, really thick A horizons, small B horizons, and then the parent material underneath that, okay? The animals in the savanna, okay? Food chains in the tropical rainforest are really, really long. You got your plants, then you got the bugs that eat the plants, the bugs that eat the bugs that eat the plants, the bugs, 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 bugs. Frog. Small mammal. Okay, but like it's a really long food chain. But in the, the uh, savanna, the food chain goes grass, wildebeest, lion. Okay, so they have really, really short food chains here because there's so much open space. Okay. All right, um, and then chemical cycling tends to be pretty rapid. Again, it's hot. There's a fair amount of water, okay? So things can decompose rapidly. Fire also helps to decompose stuff, okay? So that can accelerate the process. All right, then the desert. Okay. Like we said, there's tropical deserts or hot deserts, and then there's mid-latitude deserts, okay? Uh, that would be, that would have distinct seasons, all right? So, Basically, the big key characteristic here is it's dry. Right? So this would be a mid-latitude desert, this like Monument Valley okay, in, uh, in Utah and Arizona. How do the rocks get like that? Erosion. So there's outcroppings of you know some sort of deposit that's much harder, and then when the winds and flowing water or whatever that used to be there um, go through, that part doesn't get eroded. When the glaciers receded, they didn't get broken off. All right, so if we have a hot desert climate, you can see that the temperature doesn't change very much. I know it kind of goes up and down, but if you look at the scale here, the difference in the coldest month to the warmest month is like, what, eight degrees or so, okay? So we're not talking a huge temperature change here, okay? This is a fairly flat equatorial um, type of um, climate, okay? And if we're looking at precipitation, okay, we're looking at the wettest month gets about 60 millimeters of rain, and then there's a lot of months where there's nothing, okay? So don't get the idea that a desert gets no rain at all. Deserts get rain. It's just few and far between. Okay, so would it be possible, so this would be an equatorial desert. Would it be possible to get a desert that looked um, like this? Instead. Okay. Still the same rainfall, 
but now the temperature looks like that. Is that okay? That's what it would look like if you were in Salt Lake City in Utah or Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay? That's that's what your temperature curve would look like. Okay? You would definitely have seasons, okay, but you would still have very little rainfall. Okay? In Utah, they get snow. In Flagstaff, Arizona, there's a ski hill. Okay? So um, you know, their temperature gets down, you know, around zero, maybe even below zero in some places. Okay? And in the summertime, I mean, if you've ever been to Arizona in the summertime, they're the mirror image of what we do in the winter. Okay? They have command starts on their cars to fire up the air conditioning. Okay? Because they can't get in them until the air conditioning's been running, whereas we fire ours up when it's minus 40 because we got to warm them up before we get in. Okay. So, big thing, they're all dry. Okay. All right, vegetation. Also, don't get the idea that all deserts are shifting sand dunes. Okay? Deserts have lots of things that live in them. Okay, lots of different kinds of plants, but they're all adapted to dry conditions. So you're going to see lots of xerophytic type plants, ones that are drought tolerant. Cacti would be a big example of that. Okay, um, obviously not all deserts have saguaro cactuses. Okay, um, that's mostly a North American thing, um, but they all have kind of you know palm-like plants that can survive the dry conditions. Okay, now just to give you a heads up, when we look at a desert and we look at the prairie, there is a very fuzzy line that separates those two biomes. Okay, um, the difference between, you know, whether some place is a prairie or a desert is not necessarily this much rainfall or something that's definite. Okay, there's very much a transition that happens between them. Right, if you look at like the climate for Medicine Hat, for example, or Lethbridge, um, they look a lot like a desert. And in fact, if you go down and take pictures of certain places in that area, you might think it's a desert. Does cactus grow down there? Yeah, you get prickly pear cactus all over the place in southern Alberta. Okay? But it's not a desert, it's a prairie. But it can look like it, so you really have to read the description carefully. Don't rely on a picture on a multiple choice question to tell you what it is, because I have people that often do that. They'll look at a picture and go, oh, I know exactly what that is, and they don't read the description. And I put in a misleading picture, because, well, that's what I do. All right, soils in the desert. Basically, there's no topsoil in the desert, because there's nothing to build it up. Okay? To get topsoil, you've got to have plants that can, you know, decompose and, and build up this layer. It's so dry that any plant that dies just turns to dust, basically, and blows away. Okay? So uh, you don't get much topsoil. So you got this kind of rock-laden bee horizon that's right at the surface, and then you've got the parent material underneath that. Okay? But they're very nutrient poor. Okay, animals that live in the rainforest, or sorry, the rainforest, the desert, the opposite of that. Okay, um, you're gonna have lots of bugs again. Okay, because bugs can tolerate dry conditions as well. Okay, and you're going to have lots of like reptiles, snakes, okay, and things like that. Um, and then you can have rodents as well, because they can usually tolerate dry conditions. But a lot of your animals, especially the larger ones, will be nocturnal. It keeps them out of the sun. Okay, they're out and about when it's cooler. Okay, um, and they have to have very efficient kidneys because your kidney is what basically conserves your water, okay? Um, and they have to have other adaptations to prevent water loss, okay? For us, we're not a desert animal, okay? We use sweat to cool ourselves. That's the kiss of death in the desert, okay? If you sweat to cool yourself, you're just gonna dry up, okay, in the desert. So you gotta have other ways. So uh, lots of animals don't sweat, they pant, okay? Panting uses a lot less water. Okay? So if your dog or cat is panting, okay, what they're doing is they are um, allowing moisture to evaporate off the back of their throat, right where the carotid artery runs. And what that does is it cools the blood going to the brain, okay? but doesn't use a lot of water to do it. Way less water to pant than it does to sweat. Okay? Much less of it is wasted. Okay? Other organisms will use a flushing response. Okay? Um, we do this. It helps, to, it helps to cool our body. But if you're starting to sweat, you also tend to get flushed 
right? Your skin turns kind of red because the blood vessels, the little capillaries near the surface open and blood is allowed near the surface so that its heat can be taken away by your evaporating sweat. Okay? Well, animals in the desert will also do that minus the sweat part. So you can actually see the blood vessels in the ear of this rabbit. Okay? And so what they'll do is they'll create a flushing response. Same thing happens in our ears. Okay? But a rabbit has a much greater ability to flap its ears okay? and help to cool itself. So just go in the shade and kind of do this and that'll cool it a little bit. Okay? Um, camels. Another example, okay? They don't have water in the hump. I know you've probably been taught that, but like then I get these like people have these images of, well, if I was like dying of thirst in the desert, I'd like stab the camel and water would come out. It's not like that at all. Okay. And be one of that idea of a cactus too. Like, stab the cactus, water will come out. It's not at all like that. Okay? Um, the hump of a camel is like a big deposit of scar tissue. Okay? And there's a lot of blood vessels that flow in it. So when a camel starts to get hot, it has a, what's called a countercurrent exchange of blood. The hump will actually run a fever, and it'll get hot compared to the rest of the animal, and that's how it can cool itself. Okay? So it's more of a heat sink than it is a deposit of water. Okay? It's not storing water in its hump, although there is a fair amount of water in scar tissue, but it's not like, oh, I'm thirsty, and drink out of the hump. Like, it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> Okay. But people get that idea for some reason, because as kids, that's what we're all told, right? Oh, they store water in their hump. No, they don't. It's not a canteen. Um, why when you look at desert animals, are they often like dark colors instead of light colors? Um, mostly because they would be nocturnal. Um, they would be in the shade more often than not, not out in the sun. Um, so being dark in color would be your camouflage. OK. okay. So lots of adaptations to um, you know, surviving hot, dry conditions obviously have to be present um, in a desert animal as well as a desert plant. Okay. Now, can you survive off the water that's in a cactus? You can, actually, but it's not, again, what you think. Okay? You can't just punch a hole in a cactus and have water come out. But it's the flesh of a cactus is similar to like a cantaloupe or a honeydew. If you've ever had like any of those kind of melon fruits, okay, it's kind of like that. So you cut out the fleshy part and suck the moisture out of it. But most cacti don't taste good, okay? And they don't taste good on purpose. It discourages animals from doing exactly what you're doing, okay? from like breaking them open and eating them, okay? So uh, there is fluid in there, there is moisture in there, but it's not what you probably thought before. All right, chemical cycling in the desert, slow to absent. Things do not decompose very much in the desert because there isn't enough moisture, there's no fungi, there's not a lot of bacteria, so the conditions for decomposition are basically not there. Stuff just desiccates, okay? Just dries out, and that's basically it. Okay, temperate grassland. So look at this picture. Could this picture be misleading? If you just looked at this picture, could you possibly think I took a picture of a desert? Is there cactus in that picture? There is, okay. This is prickly pear cactus all over the place. All the grass is dead, there's rock in the background. It would be easy to mistake this for a desert. But this is taken in southern Alberta, okay, where it's definitely not desert. It's windy and dry, okay, but it's not desert. Right? So the temperate grasslands are really important because they're where we grow the bulk of the food okay, for our planet, okay, is in the, the grasslands. Okay? So 7% um, of the Earth's total land surface, and it's, again, mostly grasses. You're not going to see lots of uh, you know, trees or anything like that here. And that's because, first off, it's temperate. That means it's not near the equator, so your climatogram is going to have a bell curve. Okay? And precipitation is low and variable. There are going to be wetter times of the year and then drier times of the year. Okay? So this is what the climatogram for Calgary looks like. If you recall, we're doing the climate lesson. I told you that the wettest month in our area is June. Okay? And it is June by a significant margin. Okay? Anytime we get flooding, it's in June. Okay, that's when we get the most rainfall. It's also usually when runoff is in full effect. 
Okay, but um, most of our rainfall comes in June. Okay, that's when our um, our days are longest. We're getting the most input of solar radiation, so we can build the best thunderstorms during mid June to kind of mid July. So we get the bulk of our precipitation then. Okay, and then the rest of the year, you know, snowfall doesn't really account for a whole heck of a lot. Okay, uh, during during our winter months, we're looking at 20 millimeters. Okay, of water equivalent. Okay, so that's you know that could still be you know quite a bit of, of snow. Okay, but rainwater equivalent is not that much. Okay, um, and then obviously we got the bell curve. Okay, you know we plunge down into the minus for sure in the winter time. Okay, and we can get uh, well up into the pluses in the summer. Okay, so that picture, that's prairie. That short grass prairie that's taken just north of Medicine Hat. Okay. So, and that's in like August. So by that time everything's pretty much burnt. Would Drumheller be considered desert or grassland? No, Drumheller is still prairie, still grasslands. Um, it's just the um, the Red Deer River has carved through um, the kind of bedrock layers there that tend to be um, the deposits from the shoreline of an ancient so you get that weird layering, the badlands kind of thing. So it's not it's not a desert. They actually get a fair amount of rain, like about the same as we would get. Um, it just looks more desert-like because of how the surface is eroded. Yeah. Okay, so two different kinds of prairie, side by side, same time of the year. Okay, this is short grass prairie, southern Alberta. This is mixed grass prairie. This is like St. Paul. So around the same latitude as Edmonton. Okay. Quite a bit different. Same time of the year. These are only taken about a week apart. Okay. So much more um, kind of cooler temperatures and more regular precipitation in a mixed prairie than there would be in a short grass prairie. Okay. Big thing here, you don't see a lot of trees. There's a few trees in this picture in the back. Okay. But basically no trees in the short grass prairie. Okay. But dominated mostly by grasses. Okay, so mixed grass prairie is dominated by wheat grass, uh, fescue, okay, uh, rough fescue, peri oak grass, things like that. Okay, um, Canadian short grass prairie is spear grass and grama grass. We have a lot of fescue here. Okay, if you've ever, uh, you've seen it. If you've ever you know, like been driving along or walking along, it's the grass that's kind of gr it's obviously green on the bottom, but the seed heads are red. Okay, it's called creeping red fescue, and we have a lot of it here. It's actually what the town wants you to use for your lawn. Okay, it's one of the ones that uh, it doesn't take a lot of water. Okay, it stays green, but doesn't need a lot of water. So any, any place where the town has put down grass, that would be fescue. Okay, um, soils, big A horizons. Grasslands always have thick A horizons because every year the grass goes dormant and the next year new blades grow. So every year a layer of um, thatch, basically, Okay, uh, is left behind and then decomposes and, and turns into soil. So you build up thick soils in the grasslands. Okay. Uh, B horizons tend to be fairly thin, and then the parent material is just underneath that. Okay, so a big thing for that would be thick A horizons. Okay? All grasslands have thick A horizons. Okay, the animals. What do you not see in this picture? Right. The temperate grasslands are a highly human altered biome. Okay, um, you go back to you know the prairie provinces here. You go back two hundred years, three hundred years, and the prairies look a lot different. Not in terms of the plants, but in terms of the animals. Okay. There would be herds of thousands of bison okay, roaming the prairies here a couple of hundred years ago. Those are essentially gone. Okay? They've been hunted down so they're virtually eliminated. Okay? Uh, there would have been more deer. There would have been wolves. Okay? Wolves are almost completely absent. Okay? In fact, they're extirpated. That means they don't exist in their natural habitat anymore. Okay? Also, black bears and grizzly bears. Okay, would have lived on the prairie as well. We don't see them on the prairie anymore either. Okay? Reason for that, they eat stuff. 
Okay? This is a place where people are having their own livestock. You don't want grizzly bears and black bears and wolves where you keep your cows and chickens. Okay? So they've been eliminated. They've been forced off okay, by human activity. Okay? Um, same with buffalo. Okay? Uh, the, 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 the indigenous people of Alberta hunted buffalo, and the buffalo population remained very stable. Okay? But they also didn't cheat. Okay? When they hunted buffalo, how did they hunt them? Off the cliffs, yeah. It was pretty sporting, okay, to hunt buffalo if you were an indigenous person 200 to 300 years ago, okay? What you did, because you didn't have horses, you didn't have rifles, okay? You had spears, and you might have had the hides of, like, coyotes and, and wolves to put on to try and spook a herd of buffalo, okay? And that's what they would do. They would come up to the herd of buffalo, and they would, on purpose, spook them and get them running. That's dangerous. Okay, spooking a herd of buffalo is very unpredictable. They're not necessarily going to go where you want them to go because while they're not too bright, they're generally bright enough to realize that if you're not a wolf, they can run you over. Okay, so they would try and herd these buffalo towards a cliff. Buffalo have this one flaw. It's where their eyes are. Where, is the, where are the eyes of a buffalo? on the sides, okay? So if it was you or me, our, our eyes would be way back here if we were a buffalo, okay? Which means they have a blind spot. Where? Right out front, okay? The reason that most herbivores have their eyes more to the sides is because when they're eating, they need to be able to see their predators. So if you're, you know, hunting them, you come up from the sides and they can see you and they spook. And if you can get them running forward, you can run them off a cliff because they won't see it coming. And that's what they would do. And they would try and herd the buffalo towards the cliff. Now, generally, you don't get the whole herd, a thousand buffalo, to run off the cliff. But generally, stop and figure out that they can run you over. And, but you might be able to get one or two of them. And, and that's how they would hunt them. Once Europeans came here, it became a lot less sporting. Rifles and horses made hunting buffalo really easy. Because they're big and dumb and slow. Okay? And you just ride up on your horse and shoot them. Okay? There's not a lot of cover, there's nowhere to hide, so yeah, they didn't do so well in that situation. So we basically eliminated them. They're also not nearly as easy to domesticate as a cow. I mean, if you ever look in the eyes of a cow, there's not much there, okay? They're pretty docile, okay? They, they get herded into the, you know, the feedlot. I'm sorry if that really offends anybody, but that's what we do with them, okay? Like, they're, you, doing that with a buffalo is a lot more difficult. They got a mind of their own more so than cows do. Um, I was reading this article, and I don't know if it's true, but it was saying that like all of Alberta's buffalo went extinct after that, so we had to bring them from BC. We have brought in some buff buffalo and bison from other places, but in Wood Buffalo uh, National Park, that herd did go mm -hmm. and had to be restored from yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, um, and not not so much from hunting, but actually from wasting diseases. The population got very small, and then they were susceptible to loss by. So uh, we have lost, yeah, pretty much all of the natural population. There's still a few, but, yeah. okay. Uh, so we don't see a lot of the natural fauna because this is a human al human altered biome. We use it to grow food. We use it to produce food of all kinds, not just vegetables and grains, but also meat. Okay, this is the best biome for doing that. Okay, chemical cycling is you know, fairly efficient for a temperate biome, but because it's temperate, there are parts of the year where chemical cycling does not occur. About six months of it, because it's too cold, okay? Once it goes below freezing, decomposition basically stops, okay? Um, so decomposition is obviously slower than it would be in a tropical climate. All right, the temperate, deciduous, broadleaf, evergreen, sclerophyllous forest biome. Trees that lose their leaves, biome, okay? You just call it deciduous forest, okay? That'll be good enough, okay? So this is any of the biomes where basically we've got um, plants that lose their leaves. We're even including the chaparral, the Mediterranean one, in here because it's got deciduous plants as well, okay? So about 9% of the Earth's land surface, okay? And if you look at the climatogram for all of these, they're temperate, so they've got the bell curve for temperature, but the rainfall, is fairly even. 
Okay? And that's the key. No matter what type of forest you're going to grow, rainfall needs to be regular. Okay? Anytime you go to grassland, that's when you get the, the rainfall to peak and, and drop. Okay? The savanna, peak and drop. Prairies, peak and drop. Okay? But if we've got a forest, okay, a forest is going to have much more regular rainfall. Okay? So uh, rain, you know, our, our months are generally around 50 millimeters of rain, and that's pretty much all year. Okay, and then we've got obviously a much different looking forest in the fall okay, than, than our forests look here. Okay? When our leaves turn, it's all yellow. Okay? But if you've ever seen uh, like any of the uh, eastern provinces or central Canada in the fall, it looks way different. Okay? Like there's reds and yellows and oranges because there's lots of different types of trees. They're much more diverse than the forests here. Okay, so vegetation, again, dominated by deciduous trees, oak, beech, hickory, okay, uh, birch, hazel, sycamore, maple, obviously, okay, that's the whole Canadian maple syrup thing, okay, um, broadleaf, evergreen, temperate forests are going to be in more humid places, they're going to have oak and magnolias and palms, sclerophyllous forests are in the Mediterranean, and they're going to have things like olive, sessile oak, and pine, okay, because they're hotter and a bit drier. Okay. Uh, like tropical forests, these forests have layering, okay? just not like eight layers. So there would be like an under, there'd be like a ground level, some understory, and then a canopy, okay? not eight layers. Okay, soils, okay, um, you're going to have pretty thick A horizons in this biome because every year there's going to be a layer of leaf litter that's going to have to decompose and be added to the topsoil. Okay, um, having that leaf litter layer does make the soil tend to be a lot more loose. So being a subterranean animal is a bit more difficult because the ground tends to be softer. Okay. All right, so for the animals, it's, it's a lot. The, the food chains are, again, uh, fairly short. Okay. You're going to have your top predators. Uh, feeding directly on large herbivores, so you'd have wolves and lynx feeding on moose and elk, okay? Uh, and then you'd have, you know, smaller rodents, okay, that maybe foxes or weasels or stuff like that would, would uh, feed on, okay? Uh, even coyotes to an extent. And you're going to have some predatory birds, okay? Owls, hawks, eagles, okay? Things like that. We have those on the prairies as well, okay? But the food chains are pretty short. Okay, and chemical cycling happens a bit faster. These biomes tend to have shorter winters and obviously more precipitation, okay? So things tend to decompose a bit more quickly than they would on, say, the prairie. Okay, and then the taiga. Okay, so the taiga is like, uh, you may have also heard of it, called the boreal forest. Okay, this is most of like northern Alberta, northern BC, northern Manitoba. Okay. Um, so about 9% of the Earth's land surface relatively undisturbed by man. That's changing, obviously. Um, but this biome has a lot of natural resources. Okay, this is where um, the oil sands would be located. Okay, there can be lots of coal deposits in this biome. They, they represent places that tend to be quite rich in natural resources, including fresh water. Okay? Uh, wildfires can become prevalent because most of the precipitation in this biome is snowfall. Okay? And so by you know, midsummer, there's not a lot of rain happening. Um, there can be thunderstorms, but they often start more fires than they stop. Now, um, if we're looking at kind of places where there's boreal forests, obviously, you know, the last few years here, even the last, let's say, 15 or 20 years, there have been a lot more forest fires in our area than there would have been in, let's say, the previous 100 years or even 200 years, okay? Um, now, a lot of people will say, you know, that that's due to climate change, and they may not be totally wrong on that, okay? Certainly, the climate is getting warmer and generally drier, but... The other thing that has to be looked at is most of the taiga that is in our area and the stuff where the forest fires are happening is old growth. 
they are at the climax of, their, of that biome. They're not gonna become more complex than that. And a lot of those trees are very, very old. They're already dead. They're standing and they're dead. Okay? Or pine beetle has come through and killed them off. So you've just got a lot of fuel sitting around. Okay? And it, yes, we, we had some dry conditions and that certainly led to, to you know, forest fires. But it's also that we're, these forests tend to be in the part of their life cycle where fires are going to be more common. Um, so you'll go through that. It's called succession. Okay? And so when the forest fire happens, other plants grow up to replace, and eventually over the next few hundred years, you get that climax forest back. Logging companies do the same thing. Okay? They cut down the trees, and then they come in, they replant them, and within you know, 100 years or so, usually they would try and go between 80 and 100 years, they can reharvest the area. Okay? So it's a process, and it has to happen. Okay. Um, and it's, we're kind of in the cycle of kind of death and rebirth, okay, kind of right now. Okay, so the climate of the Tega is, to say the least, harsh. Okay, this is the biome that probably has the biggest temperature swing of any biome. So it's going to have the steepest bell curve. Okay, it's also pretty far from the equator. Okay, it's not even listed as temperate. Okay, it's very far from the equator. So they're going to have hotter summers and very cold winters. Some of the coldest temperatures on Earth are actually in this biome, not the Arctic, not like the uh, tundra, not the extreme desert. Often in this biome, okay, um, they can dip down minus 50. Okay, and we've seen that. Okay, when the polar vortex happens, you get all those people going on social media doing that thing with the hot water, where they throw it over their head and it freezes before it hits the ground. Okay, that can happen. If it gets down below minus 50, if you spit, it will freeze before it hits the ground. And you'll actually hear a snapping sound, okay, if you do it. Try it next time it gets below minus 50. Because uh, you won't be able to do anything else. Okay, um, so also a fairly dry biome, but as you can see, that rainfall is fairly even, which is again, characteristic of forested biomes. We have to have regular rainfall. Okay? Even if it's not a lot, it still needs to be regular. No extended dry periods. Okay? All right. Okay, vegetation is not diverse. Okay? As we were saying, if you go into Banff and you, know, you like to ride the gondola or whatever, okay, you're not going to see more than maybe a half a dozen different types of tree. Okay? These, you know, there's not a lot of plants that are adapted to live in an environment where they have to tolerate minus 50 and plus 35. Okay? Um, it takes you know, a pretty hardy plant to be able to tolerate that kind of thing. So you're going to have white spruce, black spruce, larch. You're going to have Engelmann spruce, Douglas fir, okay? all those kinds of pine trees, okay? maybe even some lodgepole pine okay? and stuff like that. Um, but it's generally all needles, okay? all needle leaf type of vegetation. And then there'll be some grasses and lichens and stuff like that uh, growing at ground level. Okay? Plants have to be drought tolerant because, again, this is not an overly wet biome. Rainfall is regular, but not high. Okay. Soils tend to be pretty poorly developed here, and that's because they're frozen a lot. Okay. Much of the year, they're going to have permafrost. Okay. Uh, so they're, they're not going to develop a lot of thick soils. These are usually also places where glaciers have recently geologically recently, so the last like thousand years, okay, uh, receded. So soil hasn't had a lot of time to build up, so the soils tend to be pretty thin. Now, if you're an animal who lives in the Tega, you've also got to be pretty hardy. Okay? There's basically two choices. Migrate or hibernate, okay, if you live in the Tega, because Living through the winter in the Tega is very, very difficult. There are animals that obviously do it, okay? but you have to build up a pretty significant energy reserve to be able to survive through the winter because there's not going to be a lot of food available through the winter. Okay? So you're going to have some animals who hibernate. Okay? Ground squirrels are true hibernators. That means that they reduce their metabolic rate. Okay? If you were to pick up a squirrel in the wintertime, when it's hibernating, it, you would think it was dead. It would be cold and stiff. Okay? Because they actually will lower their, their metabolic rate. Their heart will only beat a couple of times per minute. Their body temperature will drop. They'll only respire once or twice a minute. 
Okay, so quite a bit, quite inactive. Okay, a bear, which we've always been taught is a hibernator, is not. Bears sleep a lot, but their metabolic rate doesn't drop. Okay, it's why when they come out in the spring, they're so angry. They're actually hangry. Okay, because all through the fall, they just gorge. Okay, they build up these big stockpiles of fat. They eat berries and fish and okay, stuff like that. Have you ever seen like videos of? You know, grizzly bears pulling salmon out of the river, okay, stuff like that. They hunt and eat like crazy. It's why fall and late summer is one of the most dangerous times for bear encounters because they're eating so much okay, um, during that time. So they're not a true hibernator. They just sleep a lot, but they don't lower their metabolic rate. They actually live off their fat stores okay, through most of the winter. Okay? Whereas squirrels, they'll lower their metabolic rate and go into the state of dormancy, wake up shiver for you know, an hour or so until they are able to move around, eat some of the seeds that they've stored, and then go back into the state of hibernation. Um, snow cover is really important for both plants and animals to survive the winter. Okay? Snow is an insulator, okay? as we were talking about before. So if you've got a burrow, you can get it up to plus 10 inside the burrow, even if it's minus 40 outside. Okay. Snow is such a good insulator. It's got a high albedo. It's got all those air spaces where convection and conduction can't occur. Okay. But if that snow gets compressed, it loses all of its insulative ability. Okay. So a snowmobile track that goes over the burrow of an underground animal okay, will destroy the insulative value of, of that snow because it will be packed down and all the air gets forced out. Okay. So it becomes basically useless for insulation. Okay, um, what's this animal? The wolverine, yeah, okay. They're highly endangered, but uh, they do live in the taiga, okay, um, but they're, they're very rare. You can imagine all the anger and meanness of a grizzly bear concentrated into an animal the size of a German shepherd, okay? That's a wolverine, okay? It's the reason why the, the comic characters are like, always angry and have those big claws. They have big claws, okay, and they're very vicious. Okay, they'll chew on your bones and hand them back to you after. Okay, there, yeah. Very ferocious. Okay, chemical cycling is extremely slow in these kind of more polar environments. And again, that's due to the fact that not a lot of fungi can grow. And even if they can, they're only active for a couple of months. Bacteria, same thing. They can only be active when it's above freezing. All right, and when, if water is frozen, it's really hard to get anything going. Okay, so the cold temperatures really reduce the rate of decomposition. So stuff that dies can be decomposing for decades before it disappears. All right, and then the Arctic and Alpine tundra. Okay, so this is the Arctic grassland. So this is what you see if you go above the tree line in the mountains, okay, or you go far enough north that you are past the forest, okay, and you're into the, uh, into the tundra then. Okay, this is basically what it looks like. Okay, you've got kind of a mat of grasses and mosses and stuff like that. Okay, um, there's gonna be snow and ice present all year. Okay, give you an idea. This is um, the 6th of July. Okay, there's still a lot of snow sitting around. So snow will persist. Permafrost is a problem. That means the soil is frozen all year. Okay? Um, so only maybe the top, you know, couple of inches would thaw enough for, you know, the roots of grasses and things like that, but not enough for the roots of trees, which is why you don't see any trees. Tundra actually means trees. Okay? All right. Um, the other thing that they've got to deal with, and same with the tega, is the difference in daylight. Okay? In June, the sun never goes down here. Okay? In December, they don't see the sun. Right? And so day length changes a lot. That's why temperature also changes a lot okay? in these biomes. Uh, and so plants obviously have to be able to tolerate that they don't get any shade for weeks on end. Okay? But that also means that they can grow quickly and get through their life cycle in the short amount of time where it's not frozen. Okay? So they have that advantage of they get sun like 24 hours a day for four weeks. Okay, whereas plants at the equator, that would be eight weeks worth of sunshine. Okay, uh, and then the climate for the, for the tundra, okay, so we can see this is a bit misleading because the scale is a bit off. 
the, this makes it look like it gets a lot of rain, but it's just a matter of the scale. If you look at the precipitation here, this is only 60 millimeters. Right? That's not a very large amount of, of rain. Okay? So when you're looking at a climatogram, don't just look at it, look at the scale, because the scale can be misleading. Okay? Six millimeters of rain, uh, 60 millimeters of rain is just this much. Okay? That's the wettest month there. So this is not a wet biome, but that scale makes it look like it is. Okay? So always look at the scale okay? um, when you're interpreting the biome. And we can see that the temperature, okay, this is zero, so we only get above zero for four months of the year, and it's barely above zero. Okay? Warmest month is not even double digits. Okay? So this is a very cold biome. Okay? Dropping down minus 25 for months at a time. Right, vegetation, like we said, tundra means treeless, okay, so it's defined by the timber line or tree line in the mountains and the tree line at high latitudes. Tundra vegetation is composed of low growing sedges, grasses, grasses, for some reason I have that in there twice, dwarf shrubs, lichens, and mosses. Snow cover is very important because it protects the plants from the abrasive effects of blowing snow and ice, okay. Um, so yeah, this is what it would look like. That's another picture that's taken in mid-July. Right? There's still tons of snow um, present at that, at that time of year. Okay, got through it all. That's fast. You guys just let me go. That was awesome. I hate that. That's a lot of talking. I hate when I have to stand up here the whole class and just talk. It's like my least favorite lesson to teach. Okay, um, question. Oh, go back. Yeah. All right. Um, so as I said, the way that this will be tested on your test is you'll have some multiple choice questions with pictures and a description. Make sure you use both. Okay. And then tell me whether it's a deciduous biome or whether it's the temperate grassland or whether it's the tega. You have to decide that. Okay. And there'll be a climatogram and you'll need to tell me what biome it is. Okay, so look at the biome, or look at the climatogram, look at what's the rainfall pattern, what's the rainfall amount, okay, what's the temperature pattern, what's the temperature, you know, um, looking like, does it get below freezing, and then tell me. Okay, so you'll get a couple of marks for just your interpretation of the climate graph, basically telling me what's on it, this place is really dry, this place is really wet, this place is obviously very far from the equator because it's got a bell curve, or it's flat so it's near the equator, showing me your interpretation, and then some marks for telling me why it's a certain biome. Okay, there are, there's obviously one correct answer for that, okay, but if you choose a biome that's close, you would get part marks, okay, so you still have your explanation of, you know, interpreting the climatogram, but you lose marks if you don't pick the right biome, okay, everybody with me there? So will we have to, like, describe one of them for, like, the vegetation, the climate, like no, that would be for the multiple choice. Okay. So for the climate graph one, it's mostly just about the climate of that biome and it's more about being able to interpret the climate graph itself. Right? So if, you if, if you're looking at a climate graph like this one and you tell me, um, so this place is really wet and um, they get a lot of, you know, of snow in, in, or, or a lot of rain in this month and, and uh, you know, it's also you know, pretty warm. Your interpretation of that climatogram is way off. Okay, you're not going to get very many marks for that because that's totally wrong. Okay, the wettest month is 60 millimeters. This is a very dry biome. It's also very cold, okay? and it has distinct seasonality, which means it's probably really far from the equator. This would be the Arctic tundra, okay? because the Arctic tundra would show these types of things, and not a lot of trees would grow there. So we never really have to explain or like kind of reiterate all these kind of no. just kind of know them. Yeah. Okay. So mostly to recognize them for the multiple choice and recognize which uh, climate graph we go with it. Okay. So earlier in the week I posted the final exam review stuff, so that's all on Google Classroom. Tomorrow we're going to do our unit exam review, at which point I'll also post the unit exam review. Uh, sheet. It's pretty short, obviously, because there's not much to this, and we'll have to cross some stuff off of it, because I didn't change it. 
Okay, so there's still a few things on the review sheet that we didn't cover, and I'll tell you what those are and what they come up. Also, what would be like the main difference between like each kind of biome? Like what would be like kind of the uh, well, let's say like between taiga and tundra, trees, right? They're both cold. They both have very distinct seasons. The tundra is colder, okay? but from a climatogram, you may not necessarily be able to tell that the, um, the temperature is a whole lot colder. So if I gave you the climatogram for Fort McMurray, I would also accept if you said Arctic tundra, like so maybe you, you give me a great explanation of the climatogram. You say it's the taiga, you get five out of five. You give me a great explanation of the climatogram, and you tell me it's the tundra, and I go, okay, yeah, I can see why you would say that. It's not exactly right, so we may be four out of five. Right, so there's, you know, there's gray area there for sure, and I'm, I'm more concerned with can you interpret that than um, can you get it 100 percent right. right? So how, you, like, how would you determine it though? Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one that's pretty obvious. Okay. Are you going to give us like a word bank with all of these, or like we just have to memorize them? A word bank. Kind of just like it says, like Arctic tundra. And then like what, on the test? Mm -hmm. No. no so have you have to memorize them, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to picture what you meant. Oh, yeah. that's okay. That's good. All right, so we'll do our unit exam review for this unit tomorrow in class, okay? Because it's Friday, it's a short class, it's a short unit, so it fits. Uh, unit exam Monday. And then um, we'll do our, we'll review the exam on Tuesday. Just quickly go over it. That won't take very long. So on Tuesday, come with final exam questions. Okay, if there's anything you want me to go over, you know, demonstrate, whatever, that's the day we have for it. Okay, um, because there's an exam being written in my classroom on Wednesday. Um, so I won't be able to have a help session here. Okay, questions from you guys. You are officially done learning new stuff. That's the last new thing I have to teach you. <sighs> Take a big time. You're all done. Okay, that's it. That's science 10. All right. Uh, so if you guys clear off those desks, I'll come around and wipe them down here. Hey, right, those of you in the live stream, see you tomorrow.